Oh, uh, I believe that the very first presentation belongs to Neantro. Uh, uh, after all, uh, I would like to ask if uh, anybody would like to to ask or to talk of something before Neantros. Is, is everybody okay to talk, to speak? So let's start with Neandro Saavedra Rivan. Let me talk something about this very important professor. And the presentation of Neandro Saavedra is about how the pandemic will affect the economy. That's the title. Neandro Saavedra is a visiting professor at University of Brasilia and professor emeritus from the University of Tsukuba, Japan. He, is, he has graduate studies in mathematics and economics at the University of Louvain, Lille Paris, and Columbia University. He is resulting in a PhD in math and a PhD in economics. Neandro uh, is a Ross Fellow. So, Leandro, let's start. You have 15 minutes. Thank you, Daniel. Let me share my screen. Uh, okay. Here. <clears throat> well, the title is very, uh, was selected just to be um, in the spirit of this uh, seminar perspectives on post-pandemic. This is a session on economy and development. So um, I am going to talk about my views on how uh, the current pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic is going to affect the economy in the future, not, not right now. We can see, of course, everybody can see how it is affecting in the short term. Now, um, of course, the pandemic is uh, one of several global crises that uh, are affecting the world in general. It is perhaps um, the only one we think about now because um, it is really very hard on all of us. Um, I cannot imagine a single person on earth who is not aware of this, uh, of this crisis. Now, if we look at other crises, which are uh, even more important as uh, Gary reminded us in his um, opening presentation, um, people are not so aware of the, for instance, the environmental crisis. Uh, although um, it is um, going to have uh, very likely more serious effects. Um, the aging crisis uh, also is a very, very serious global crisis uh, that is going to, to affect, to have many, many impacts in the long term. However, these are more insidious crises in the sense that many people are not really aware of them. It is easier to deny their existence than in the case of the, of the pandemic. Also, even in the, for the pandemic, there are some uh, deniers, but it is much more difficult um, to deny the, pan the pandemic than to deny the environmental crisis. So uh, it is important to put in perspective the current pandemic in, as being one of a, what I would call a complex of <clears throat> global crises. Now, having said that, so crises are supposed to be bad, and they are, of course, bad, um, but it is undeniable that um, crises have a transformative effect on the world we live in. Until now, humanity has gone through many crises uh, and we have uh, overcome them all. Um, and we can argue, I think it is an argument, of course, nobody will agree with that, but uh, in most cases, I would say that the world after the crisis is better than the world before the crisis. In a sense, we are better prepared to deal with what comes next. That is not to say that the crises are good, but it is a fact that after them, very often, <clears throat> the transformed world is in a better situation. Now, this transformation, if we think about the transformation of individual social activities, 
It's something that has been going on for some time already. Technology, particularly information and communication technologies, they are transforming the way in, in which we do things as individuals and also as a society. So this is something that has been going on. Now, the pandemic is, is actually accelerating uh, this kind of transformation. And um, some of them are being imposed on us. And we tend to believe that after the end of the pandemic, things will go back to quote unquote normal. But uh, most likely, many of these imposed transformations uh, are going to stay with us. So this is, um, this is an important fact. I have been thinking a lot about, um, about um, this. Well, I am an economist. And also, it happens that um, over the last year, just in the middle of, of the pandemic, I started a new chapter in my professional life. I joined the graduate program in transportation at the University of Brasilia, which was a rather new field for me. Um, and I was able to, to think a lot about both things together, the pandemic, uh, transportation. I came to the conclusion, this kind of insight, that the most important effect of the pandemic, in terms of economics, of course, because there are others, uh, was on mobility. Because mobility is so central to all of human and social activities. Uh, if we were not aware of that, we really are much aware now that we are, many of us, confined to our homes or our spaces. Uh, it is very hard to travel internationally. Um, so mobility is really uh, very important. Uh, now, in of course, <clears throat> mobility, In if we think at the... Uh, science fiction and i like to think of science fiction because uh, i believe that um, science fiction at least from the, from the times of jules verne and up to asimov um, has been a kind of predictor of things that um, that we are going to experience in real in real life so science fiction has been thinking about mobility as well and there are many um, of these um, dystopias um, where we are deprived of mobility, but still we are around, we do things. Uh, think about uh, probably many, most of you have watched Matrix uh, or Surrogates, uh, this uh, movie with uh, Bruce Willis. So in this possible futures, um, we do not move, but we are everywhere. Uh, we travel, we have experiences. <clears throat> so you see how mobility um, in principle, at least in fiction, could change, could be different. We could be physically just limited, but it does not mean that we do not have all sorts of activities. Um, so this is something to, to think uh, about. Of course, transformation has not been so um, root as in these movies, but uh, it gives us a glimpse into possible, into possible ways in which mobility could be transformed and economic activities, of course, together. So just to give some, some examples of uh, our activities that involve or used to involve mobility, working. Um, so it's we would go out to work. So every day people would uh, wake up early, have breakfast and go for a conference, uh, office uh, and other to the factory, whatever job. Now, uh, during the pandemic, not everybody, but many people are working at home. And uh, enterprises have discovered that productivity really is not going down and that uh, they have much less costs, um, no transportation costs. It has good effects uh, on traffic uh, in the cities. Uh, so very likely working at home is going to become more and more uh, the norm rather than an exception that was imposed upon us during the pandemic. 
they start learning. Um, again, we had a lot of talk about that yesterday. We had two, uh, two sessions where education was, uh, was um, one of the subjects. And uh, of course, uh, at the end, uh, there was uh, this um, talk about uh, how really distance education uh, cannot replace um, uh, normal education, but some kind of hybrid uh, could, be, could be found. So for sure, there will be plenty of development in that. Even when we go back to the classroom, uh, I believe that the way in which lectures will be delivered is going to be different. And there will be many uh, tools that come from distance learning. And uh, so uh, there is plenty of room for improvement on education using the tools uh, that we are using now that have been imposed upon, upon us. Online shopping. Uh, of course, again, something that existed already, Amazon has been around uh, for many years, uh, but we have seen how uh, this has uh, really um, increased enormously. Uh, many other competitors, uh, uh, local competitors have appeared in, in Brazil, for instance, uh, this has grown enormously. Now for five minutes more. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, so online shopping is, um, is another area uh, which uh, growth has been tremendous during, and it will not stop. For sure, we are not going back to normal in, in that case in commerce, yes. Similarly for deliveries, um, which is uh, not exactly the same than online shopping. Uh, deliveries is when you, for instance, if I wanted now um, a cappuccino. Uh, uh, in Brasilia, we do not have that service, but uh, in Istanbul, for instance, um, a new startup, uh, you just call them and in less than 10 minutes, you have your cappuccino. Um, so uh, that kind of service uh, is very convenient, uh, really. It's not something that will, will disappear after the pandemic. Well, I do not need uh, many examples for video conferencing. We are just having one now. Um, businesses um, have um, noticed how uh, much money they are saving on business trips for many trips that were not really uh, needed. So um, again, uh, uh, video conferencing uh, is going to, to continue. Now, uh, all of these activities, um, they are rather rudimentary right now. Uh, you know, this, this seminar that we are having now, it could be very different. Uh, that will be very different when the tools of virtual reality are very well developed. They could happen in a way that we really forget that we are not together. Um, there is plenty of research going on on, um, on virtual reality. And eventually, uh, virtual reality and associated tools, you know, so, so far it is only sight, but other, other senses are going to be incorporated. So you will really believe that you are there. Uh, so that that's, uh, moves me back to the to this movie Surrogate. If you have not seen it, I recommend it to you. Um, so virtual experiences um, is something that is for sure will have enormous development, and it is uh, in a sense an effect of this pandemic. Tourism, for instance, um, is one area in which uh, well we are not seeing tourism now, but it could develop without the need of you physically going somewhere else. Um, telemedicine that was mentioned uh, um, yesterday also, um, still rudimentary, uh, but we can see already many tools uh, going from, uh, <clears throat> from wearable artifacts like watches um, and others. Um, and of course, more sophisticated tools that will be used by doctors. So eventually telemedicine, uh, will substitute uh, uh, and will um, help a lot uh, medical services. Uh, just think about providing medical service in the Amazon region uh, of Brazil or in some of the many islands in the Philippines or Indonesia uh, when you do not have uh, regular normal medical service. So um, I would say that the, um, 
legacy of the pandemic will be that. Um, many more um, advanced the, the mobility will be redefined uh, in such a way that in many cases, it is not physical mobility that is taking place, but our senses are being transported elsewhere um, in many different ways, depending on the context, whether it is mm -hmm. learning, whether it is tourism, um, whether it is um, work. Um, in particular, an important, uh, I still have 30 seconds, I believe, um, in, the, um, in the context of the city, um, smart city, this uh, notion that has become popular uh, will really uh, be redefined as well. There will be a new perspective on city structure, uh, and that will have very important economic effects on real estate values in downtown areas uh, and so on. So uh, that is my what I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Neandro. Um, let's get to some questions and discussions. Let's let these questions and discussions to the end of this session. So uh, the next presentation will belong to me. <laughs> I'll share my presentation with, with you and then um, I'll, I'll and we will proceed to the next presentations and discussions and questions to the end, as I said. Uh, I'll start to tell you that this presentation is belongs to a theoretical body. This theoretical body belongs to a primary um, study that I publish at Cadmus Journal and, and belongs to a, a line of research that I am developing. Uh, the, the, cons the main concept belongs to the power externality uh, insight. Uh, externalities, yeah, I am an economist, uh, and I, I forgot to present to myself, but I am a professor at the University of Brasilia and associate fellow at UOS, and I am an economist. The concept of externality is original originally done by an economist. And then this concept is uh, nowadays being widespread for many uh, areas. And this concept, I took this opportunity to share, let me say share or to coordinate with other concepts that we use in social sciences. So the concept of power externality um, search for coordinate the concepts of social power, governance, and business cycles. And the concept of power externality can be um, defined as you see in the picture. The, let, let, me to, let me read this. Power externality is a situation where the interconnected social power and relations jointly with political, economic, business cycles and governance agendas affect a third part. This is the most important to, to note this. In this case, the society and the environment, these parts are not directly related to this matter, but can suffer the effects of the social actions. Of course, there is positive and negative power externalities. Okay, I, uh, I'll let you to read the concept of positive and negative power externalities. The main focus of this presentation is spill over effects of positive power externalities. So let me read the concept of positive power externality in order to, to handle you to the to uh, well comprehension of what I mean about the spillover effects of positive power externalities. Positive power externality is a situation where, although government and society are aware 
of uncertainties and challenges regarding the application of public policies and so on, due to the flexibility and interconnectivity between social power relations along with business cycles and governance agendas, the best choice in terms of public policies are more likely to be achieved as a research society as well as the environment benefit. So it's a, a good, uh, it's a positive, how can I say, uh, um, cycle of um, effects. Uh, we, uh, it, uh, it goes around all the society and the environment and so on. So uh, let's talk about the spillover effects the, of positive paristernalities. This is the new concept that I'm working with power externalities. Broadly speaking, let me read again. Spillover effects refers to the impact that seeing unrelated events can have on the societies and the environment. There are positive and negative with spillover effects. Let me say that spillover effects is another concept that we study in economics. Uh, once again, I am trying to put this concept together with, the, with other concepts in social science, as I said before. In the following, in the following scheme that I, I will show you, you, you in the next slide, in a post-pandemic world, positive power externalities generated by an environmental behavior must be stimulated. This exact talks about uh, clean energy in, a, in an schematic way, of course. It emphasizes a way to demonstrate the potential spillover beneficial effects of the multiple social actions and public policies that can be chosen by the society. So I am, I am talk about positive power externalities because I wonder, I desire a better future. Okay, but uh, there can be uh, negative power externalities. Okay, so uh, the spillover effects are a type of networking effect that can increase if there will be leadership and incentive. As I said, and I will stress, um, and spillover effects of negative power externalities can be possible um, too. But let's talk about the positive effects. Oh, I can't read my picture because the the zoom screen. So let's see. Uh, the basic structure of this triangle uh, of power externality, as I as I told you, um, in, um, coordinates social power relations, um, governance structures, and business cycles. Business cycles is uh, a, a kind of uh, resume of the economic body, uh, like externalities and spillover effects that I put together with the other structures of social power and governance. Let's see the social power, the main head of this triangle. We have social potential power, institutional social power, and social formal power. These uh, forms, this kind of social power, the uh, World Academy and Mr. Gary Jacobs works with, and then I took this concept together with the externalities, spillover effects, and governance that is a field that are, um, I, uh, there, there is another field of human science in order to uh, connect these concepts, as I told you, and in the case of spillover effects, uh, the positive power externalities, and uh, I would like to stress we are talking about a solar energy scenario in an uh, idealistic way, of course. So let's see inside the triangle that we have a positive power externalities of solar energy scenario. Uh, remember uh, what, what about talk uh, energy, solar energy talks about. Of course, you know, it, it is rene renewable, not polluting in reduce, reduce environment costs of global warming. What are the links that can spread these positive power externalities to spill over positive effects? 
social potential power, NGOs, or other, other things, pro-environment behavior of spread good practices, discussion groups, sports arena, and let's see the social informal power, government authorities, alternative energy sources, corporations. And uh, I will talk about uh, too about the media. How can I say social influencer, media influencer? Nowadays we can consider, we must consider these people for um, spread good or bad or bad press or presses, of course. And let's talk about institutional social power. He's the most, not the most important, but uh, and if you can. Uh, if I consider that it, this could be an institutionalist theory, theoretical model, we can consider that institutional social power is the most important way because we have decision makers, policy makers work on policies at all. Okay? So let's talk about in the last five minutes about business cycles. Um, business cycles as I told before, talks about the cost, economic concepts that I that I put to uh, handle with the power externality triangle. Uh, I'll tell again, and this is part of another uh, another paper that I published before. So the theoretical foundation is inside this paper. I'll, I'll not waste time talking about again this theoretical line of of how can i say line of uh, thinking but the business cycles and economics of course talks about the economic concepts of spillover spillover effects and first and second best solutions that links this power these concepts of the power triangle the governance structures the third one inputs another theoretical body and uh, that belongs to international relations um, area that talks about the bottom up and the but bottom up and the top down decision making of 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 international institutions this theoretical body uh, uh, is um, uh, is well done developed in the previous paper that I mentioned before. But let's finish the presentation with the possible spillover effects. So let's see, we have link one, two, and three. Uh, link one, uh, of course, links social power and business and economic cycles. And the, the spillover effect will, uh, uh, in link one is talking about spreading the use of solar energy. It induces a fall in the price of solar energy. It means that demand for coal and gas are sub that are substitutes of solar energy is likely to fall either in the short or in the long run. The falling demand for coal and gas in those firms live in those industries. So, consequently, there is a fall in supply. This increased competition could lead to lower energy prices for the consumers. Of course, I'm talking about a, a very uh, positive spillover effect of this externality in a future post in a post pandemic future that considers the need of society and the environment working in a positive way of well-being not only for humans but the environment and the animals and so on let's talk about briefly spillover effect in link two uh, link two, of course, links business economic cycles and governance structures. Of course, in these links uh, we can have governments can give incentives or subsidies to produce solar energy. In the absence of adverse shocks, governments can make pro-cyclical policies, including incentives of using clean energy. So to finish, let's talk about the uh, spillover effect in link three. Link three, 
of course, link social power and governance. Uh, let's see, public and private incentives to research and development of new techniques, as we told before along this event. Innovation in clean energy and society develops a new behavioral paradigm, eco and environmental. So to finish the presentation, uh, spillover effects belongs to a wide line of thinking and research. E, and e, we can, what I can see to finish is, if you consider the spillover effects of positive power externalities generated by human actives and or appropriated public policies by the governments, there will be a vast field of economic, effective networking actions that can be implemented by the humankind in a post-pandemic world. Positive spillover effects proposes that engaging in one behavior affects the probability of engagement in a second behavior. Therefore, the social actions and government policies not only can stimulate positive power externalities and also spill over them. So, my friends and colleagues, I finish my presentation with this mention. Thank you very much. Well, let's I say the comments, let, thank you very much. Uh, the comments and questions to the end. Let me present Professor Joanilio Teixeira. Let me talk something about the Professor Joanilio Teixeira. He's also a very important and kind professor. Professor here in Brazil and abroad. Janine Rodolfo Teixeira uh, is a emeritus professor at the University of Brasilia, fellow of and um, besides his uh, CV so short here, we can see uh, his huge contribution ab abroad. Janine, <laughs> let's start your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, dear colleagues and friends, uh, my warmest regards and wishes to you and all other participants in this, in this event. The theme of my communication is political economy and socioeconomic perspectives. And of course, I'm very worried about the COVID-19. I tend to consider that is important, very important, to take a view from a kind of heterodox framework in the sense that I consider both propositions, inquiries, and legacies from the heterodox economists. Being this the case, I intend to take my view uh, based on some propositions based on the works of Keynes, John Maynard Keynes, Mikhail Kaletsky, leading to post-Keynesians and post kaletskian structures. Let me say that both Keynes and Kaletsky's views contains a number of propositions very similar concerning the causality of growth and distribution, running from investment to saving, the importance of governmental stimulus and some control on economic activities and employment, the effective demand as the main determinant of output, and et cetera. Well, this is well known. The point is this, Kaletsky, provided important foundations to deal with social classes. And this I consider very important. As well as economic power and distribution of income. Well, I have the feeling that most of the important contributions in the political economy recently are coming from the heterodox school essentially a kind of post kaletskian approach. Of course, this kind of view that I have is not considered very familiar to most economists. 
Here I have no more than 15 minutes to discuss some important points. And instead of being concerned with theoretical things, I prefer to deal especially with problems raised by the COVID-19 and things like this. Let me say that I prefer to consider together post Keynesian and post Kalesian approaches as part of the same heterodox family. As I said before, somewhat, uh, this vision is not immune to controversies and probably a combination of the two alternatives will illuminate future projects and actions to get a better society and to control somewhat the situation, the present situation in many countries, especially in Latin America. Well, let me say that fundamental questions need to be asked and responded concerning the COVID and the pandemia nowadays. Naturally, the pandemic problem starts less than one and a half year ago. It means that we do not have yet very good formal works dealing properly with the subject. It takes time to do good work. Anyway, we need important questions, fundamental questions, and furthermore, we need to be able to communicate these ideas in such a way that people and government can proceed in a proper way. Let me say that we need to consider nowadays some fundamental questions and to deal with the new strategies required in order to promote leadership in thought and actions leading to human development, structural change, and economic dynamics, including employment. This is especially true in these days in which the coronavirus and the pandemia are too present in many countries, many countries. This means that the political economy has a battle to fight against the tragic situation. Well, at the moment, since we have very few minutes, I would like to raise some questions that I consider important, or some points that I consider important. For instance, one, the public service must have as objective to anticipate health crisis, track patient, and disseminate the proper information. In this vein, it is necessary to understand the personal and social reality. The consequences of neglecting these necessities tend to be disastrous. And this is the case of most of many countries, including Brazil. Two, I consider that the closure of schools provoke regression of learning. This loss of time is not easy to be solved. And this is especially difficult for an impoverished region and country. Being this the, uh, the problem, we need to ask this question. What institutional support the government is capable to offer? Three, the learning disaster is not the only collateral damage caused by the negligence of authorities. Under the pandemic reality, there is increasing suffering from side effects such, such as degenerative, life-threatening, and disabled diseases. This is very present in many countries. How to do with this? Five, risks of a new disease outbreak remain probable, even when, fortunately, the present crisis will be contained. But 
we need to prepare society for such epidemic emergency now and in the future and not forget that many countries that many countries record many diseases many other diseases however although we have this present problem i am sure that the discussion of a post pandemic is not a case of science fiction no is something very important otherwise what can you do when the the time comes and we are not prepared for the next crisis six the spending pattern favored by climate conditions poor housing bad public transport and the unfair distribution of income may lead the one not to be optimist about the future of the planet i see that many people are concerned with this and my view is that we are not preparing ourselves properly for the future i am somewhat less optimist about this than most of my colleagues well we need urgently new perspectives on structural change political and social economic development we need to be concerned about learning 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 to deal with the process of inclusive growth poverty reduction and environment sustainability this requires fair contributions from the world academy of art and science from the post keynesian and post kalesk scholars this will come but it will take time we cannot forget that economics is very much associated with political economy in the sense that policies are required and it's not very simple to change the power yes to come power in favor of the less privileged people last but not the least last but not least we must learn how to influence people and to stimulate authorities to act properly research and knowledge has to be captured this will make eventually fruitful directions for a better society i have the impression that most of the points that i have raised have been already raised by many colleagues in this case i must confess that we still need to much things to do and unfortunately the time is running and poor people especially poor people are involved in deep troubles and we need to consider this properly without forgetting the future as i said before the future is not something that may be considered just a kind of fiction so thank you very much and congratulations to my colleagues and to the participants for this event thank you very much professor janilio miss you <laughs> Okay. So, let me present our colleague to speak to us. Uh let me present Professor Germano Swartz. Professor Germano Swartz will talk about the following presentation: COVID-19 and the primacy of functional differentiation in hydroxychloroquine. the case the law between health science and economic system professor germano swartz is the current rector of uniter in brazil and holds a phd in law 
Please, Professor. Hi. Hi. Thank you very much for the presentation, dear Daniel. I would like to I would like to tell to all of you that it's an honor to be here today talking with such uh, important intellectuals about this, let's say, current problem of the social sciences, not only of the social sciences, but also a problem that it is uh, permanent and it will be permanent in our social global system. Well, when I, when I wrote this paper, it was December last year. So when, when, I, when I start to think about the problem, about the problem that the title, it's, it's pretty self-evident when, when it says that I will try to argue that it is needed more than ever to maintain the functional differentiation of the social systems when we face a pandemics, in this case, COVID-19, that I will use uh, for sure uh, the theoretical basis that Nicholas Luhmann has defended and developed, developed all his life uh, when we talk about uh, sociology and in my case, especially sociology of law. So uh, in advance, please accept my excuses. I'm not an economist, I'm not a politician, I'm just a simple lawyer. And when I say that I'm just a simple lawyer uh, and a researcher in law, uh, I must say that we, we, the ones who deals with law, and I can see my dear, dear friend here, Professor Eron Gorgilio, uh, that we are trained to see the problems, to solve the problems accordingly, uh, an, a specific code, which is hashed and hashed. I prefer the German version version of the of the world because, and I will start my explanation now, trying to tell to all, to all of you that in my opinion. Uh, the hashed and unhashed, it means necessarily that law and society are connected, but not only connected, they, in terms of evolution, they co-evolution. There is no a single evolution. The systems can only evolve if they are connected. If they are not connected, you can't you can you cannot talk about coevolution of the all social systems that composes the social system global social system so uh, i took an example for brazil the hydroxychloroquine case and again when i was writing this paper in december last year uh, I thought, being very naive, that, I don't know, five, six months later, it would be an old case to talk about hydroxychloroquine. But that's all about, in the news in Brazil right now, hydrox hydroxychloroquine, the problem of the science system, the problem of the health system, and also the problem of the politician system, uh, because we are now seeing in our parliament uh, commission that voted to investigate to, to investigate if Brazilian government uh, has failed in order to buy vaccines, because let's say the government should have preferred to to indicate hydroxychloroquine as the most appropriate answer to the COVID-19 problem in Brazil. And for the ones who are not Brazilians here, the line of reasoning of our government was that 
and I am I'm being very simplistic here. Please understand that I don't have all the time I need to explain what is uh, what I would like to, to explain right now. But the line of reasoning in order to defend the use of hydroxychloroquine to patients with COVID-19 in Brazil was economic. Because if you come back and if you take the posts that the Brazilian government, especially our president, wrote on Twitter uh, in April, May, and also in June last year, you will see that this, this phrase, this line, was very, very spread around networks, social medias, and etc. And the line was, it is better to maintain the economic alive because we cannot buy vaccines because vaccines are not scientifically tested. So uh, I, I will not here for sure try to, 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 to explain what, what Lumen's defense, because Lumen died before COVID-19 for sure. He died in 1997, last, last, last century. But what we can, what we can gain analyzing analyzing the problem of the hydroxychloroquine using Lumen's theory uh, regarding law system, health system, science system, and economic system. Okay, I will try to summarize that, saying that you need the COVID-19 pandemic presents itself as a real factor of systemic blockage or corruption as a professor that it's that came from University of Brasilia, Marcelo Neves defense. Well, if you think or if you let communications, let's say economic, economic communications being the ones that will be used by this, the health system, let's say, you will have communication broken or corruption of the systems. And if you have corruption of the systems, you have not the differentiation of the functional systems. You have the exactly opposite, the, the differentiation. And the, the differentiation is the real danger for uh, complex societies. When, when we think about complex society, we must remember as well that for Lumen, uh, contemporary societies, they, they have a single, uh, uh, um, the most important characteristic of contemporary societies is for sure the complexity. But the complexity is, uh, is uh, the possibility that you can have more than one op option in order to take risks. There is no risk if you have only one option. Okay, when we have a, a contemporary com com and complex society like the one that we are living right now, we have a lot of options. We have a lot of medicines. We have a lot of ideological um, parties. We have a lot of economic theories. And how can we be sure to, to choose one or another? Including the case of the vaccines of the COVID-19, the real, 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 real truth is that we are, um, we have developed vaccines faster than ever. We have tested vaccines faster than ever. So if you talk about uh, uh, the social, the social, the, the, the people that belongs to the, to the science, science sciences, you will see that they are, they are saying, okay, 
the risks that you are taking uh, getting a shot of the vaccines, it's less dangerous than if you do not have the shots. But they are not telling you that you are completely safe. But th Thank this you, is not... Professor. How many? Two? Okay. Then I... Then I go to, to the conclusions because I think I, I, I make my point clear. And I would say that uh, what, what should I say to you that it's the specific function of the science system in the case of COVID-19? And the function is attesting the veracity that hydroxychloroquine has in COVID-19 treatment. Using the code true or false, which is very basically the code of the science, we can say recursiveness with protocols, tests, metrics, among others, that COVID-19 patients cannot be treated with hydroxychloroquine. But See, you cannot confuse science system with health system because health system deals with health and illness code. And remember that the health is just an image on the horizon. You have no health. What you have, what you feel is the illness. So uh, you, we use the health as a goal as something that we are always looking for, that we are expecting to have health, okay? But the doctors in the health system, they need to know what is true or what is not true according to uh, hydroxychloroquine, hydroxychloroquine case. And it's not their jobs to choose if you need or if you have the need to take hydroxychloroquine over a vaccine, because this kind of information, it comes from the uh, science system and the economic system. How can the economic system be related to the role of the social science system and to the role of the health social system. Well, uh, the economics for Luma, it's not about being paid or not being paid. Or it's not about payment nor payment. It's about how to deal with scarcity. And we are dealing right now with a crisis of scarcity of vaccines. The, the decisions that we have made last year, they are affecting us right now because there is a scarcity of a scarcity of vaccines in the world. And when you deal about uh, uh, scarcity, you need to know that you you take you need to have some risks to make some let's say gambles. I will say that I don't know. Pfizer, it's a better option than CoronaVac. Then CoronaVac can get can be more effective than I don't know Oxford shots of vaccines. But in the end, in the end, scarcity with science and with health will for sure, and that's the problem of the law right now. Will for sure at some point will require law decisions. And as I have stressed when I have started my, my speech here, I said that I use hashed unhashed as a code of the law system, which it means, at least for me, following Lumen, that as a simple lawyer, I will have to have information from economic system, health system, uh, uh, the other systems that I just have mentioned because I forgot.
And the problem, the real problem is that, unfortunately, Heron, Heron, unfortunately for me, Germano, I am not trained for that. I need to believe that information that comes from the other system, they are texted, tested according to the other systems. Because the real problem in the end, it's a problem about trusting. We need to trust it that economics will do your job, scientists will do your job, health and doctors will do their job. Because when we have a pandemic, we have the real danger of uh, corruption of the systems. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Germano. Um, let's start the last, but not the only very important presentation in this session. This presentation belongs to Professor Julio Rocha. Professor Julio Rocha, are you okay? Are you, can you, can we start with your presentation? Okay, let me... Yes, yes morning. I, I have, a, a, I, have, I can share a little bit. Let me present you before, please. Okay, Professor Julio Rocha is Brazilian, and he is the director of the Faculty of Law of University, Federal University of Bahia, Brazil. And he is associate professor of the Uni Federal University and of Bahia, too. He is professor of master's and PhD in law uh, of University of Bahia, too, and professor and vice coordinator of Ginter Interinstitutional Doctorate in, uh, in this university. He is PhD in law. Please, please Professor Julio Rocha, Rocha um, your presentation. Yes, uh, I would like to thank uh, the organizing committee, Professor Sandy Pinheiro, Gorgolino de Souza, Casale Bahia, Saavedra Rivano, Gordilho e Teixeira. Uh, I would like to thank my moderator here, Professor Sandy Pinheiro from UNB, and my colleague Saavedra Rivano, uh, Teixeira and Schwartz. Uh, uh, the speech, my speech, uh, will address the issue of indigenous and Quilombola peoples in the face of the federal authorities' failure to respond to the pandemic COVID-19. Decisions by the Supreme Court have fostered measures to protect traditional communities Claims of non-compliance with a fundamental precept at the PF 709-742, but the implementation of protection has been hampered by public authorities, including local authorities. Brazil hit the mark of 426,000 deaths caused by COVID-19. The Federal Supreme Court has been asked to resolve issues raised to guarantee the protection implementation of right to health and several proposed actions, including a discussion of the constitutional powers of the federal entities. Faced for vulnerability of traditional peoples and communities that reach the mark of almost 5 million people, indigenous people, and Quilombolan communities, Black communities, have filed lawsuits to guarantee the right to the health of indigenous and Black communities with preliminary injustice granted. In particular, uh, for indigenous people, which bring together 305 distant peoples, a DPF 709 was filled by articulation of indigenous people on Brazil, a PIB, along with six other political parties, pointing out various omissive and commissive acts that violate their rights, among which 
the non containment of invasions of indigenous land, of the removal of the invaders, forcing contact with tribes, mistaking actions by the federal authorities and health matters with the entry the indigenous lands of health teams without quarantine compliance and without the observation of measures to prevent contagion, political decision by the National Indigenous Foundation, FUNAI, and CESAI to only provide specialized health care to people reside, residing in approved in indigenous lands, referring the no village to General uh, Sistema Unico de Saúde, failure to elaborate a detailed and concrete plan which contains a, a strategy for the protection of indigenous communities and an implementation schedule with the participation of indigenous communities. The situation of uh, um, uh, traditional communities in, in Brazil is uh, dangerous, is a, a situation um, uh, that you have to deal. Uh, the preliminary injunction was partially approved and confirmed and in plenary of uh, Supreme Court, determine, determine the creation of sanitary ba barriers that prevent third parties for enter the territory, a creation of a situation room for the management of actions to combat the pandemic regarding indigenous people and isolation in recent contact, inclusion in the COVID-19 monetary plan for indigenous people in emergence measure for the content and isolation of invaders in relation to indigenous communities alternative measure able to avoid contact immediate extension of the services of indigenous health subsystem to village peoples located in no approved lands extensions of the services of indigenous health subsystem to no several indigenous people when there is in barrier to access to general unified health system. And finally, the elaboration of monitoring coping plan for Brazilian indigenous people. In relation to the Kalimbola communities, so black communities in the Federal Supreme Court also, indeed the judgment of the fundamental law and non-compliance arrangement at the PF 742, the action was proposed by the National Coordinator for Black and Colombian Communities, CONAC, together with five political parties. In the decision, the court established the federal authorities must present a plan to confront COVID-19 in Quilombola, in addition to guarantee priorities of vaccination these communities. CONAC celebrates the decision, but stresses that it is necessary to monitor to effective compliance by authorities of all points of a DPF. The Supreme Court suspend an eviction or removal for communities until the end of pandemic. A DPF's request included the addition to a coping plan and priority vaccination, the establishment of a national work group to debat, approve and monitor the plan and the inclusion, raise color, ethnicity, and the COVID-19 records. In addition, the public new case, the letter is already an obligation imposed by the law. And however, people and communities report difficulties in implementing the measures, including at the local level in Brazil, where municipal authorities have created obstacles to the vaccination of traditional community for example, in Bahia and in Colombo Conceição uh, de Salinas, for example, uh, in Bahia. Otherwise, vaccination against COVID-19 has been considered slower for indigenous people. Furthermore, a PIB CONAC have articulated the own monitoring of death and contaminations by COVID or indigenous and quilombolas and made available articulation for the public entities. In conclusion, in conclusion, Brazil reaches alarming rates of deaths caused by infections by SARS-CoV-2. Furthermore, traditional peoples and communities are more vulnerable 
to the effects of COVID-19 and greater difficult in assessing public health policies and infrastructure. Despite the difficulties imposed by the omission of federal authorities, the role of traditional peoples and communities has determined the mitigation of the effects caused by the uh, public policies through demands in Supreme Federal Courts, the role of indigenous and Quilombola representations in proposed at the PF has guaranteed protections of lives, health, memory, and tradition. Thank you very much for everybody. And uh, you wait the debates later on. Thank you. Thank you very much, your Professor Julio Rocha. Your presentation about the minority, minorities and the Indian communities were, was and is very important in this, in, the, in this context of pandemic. But these communities, in my opinion, are always uh, forgotten about the societies. And these, and these communities are very close to uh, the environment. Uh, in my opinion, they contribute to preserve the environment, actually. So, uh, if the other speakers agree, uh, we can start a brief uh, discussions and question sessions. Uh, this, uh, this discussion and question sessions uh, should take about 15 minutes too. Okay, uh, and then I would like to ask if some, somebody has a um, question or, or, or something to comment about any presentation. Please. Uh, no, no comments. Professor Gugolino, would you like to talk something, would you like to comment something about the end presentation? Yeah, oh, yeah, yes. Yes. I, I just uh, unmuted. Oh, I thought they were very good presentations, and of course there's space for questions because I'm sure there are different issues, and some of these issues, I'm sure, have raised questions in the minds of the participants. I don't myself have any special questions. I, I, would, I would like to mention your own presentation on the social power externalities is something important and I, I think we can zoom for discussion there and then the question will be how would this apply to Latin America or to other countries in Latin America not only uh, in your analysis made in Brazil this will be one question to you as a presentation I, I, sorry, sorry, sorry. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't understand. I didn't understand. Yes, the question. So, sorry, Professor. Is don't mute, be saying you can hear. You are muted. Have you, can you hear me now? Yes, 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 now, yes, yes. Now, yes. Okay, I, I would like to ask, to ask you, your presentation, power externalities, positive and negative, you apply this to Brazil, or this would apply also to other countries in Latin America, or in, in general? I believe this is a theoretical body. I am, it, it is not process of building, and the, the, that scheme of solar energy is just a scheme, a general scheme. And asking about your question precisely, yes, it can, it can be applied to Brazilian reality, yes. Uh, this, the question of power externalities and spillover effects talks about spreading good or not good or bad practices uh, abroad. And this practice could be 
policies, could be behavior of societies, uh, could be, uh, how can I say, there are days, social media influencers, and this can work in a, uh, in a good way or in a bad way. Uh, and for the future, um, I put uh, um, a nice scenario, spreading uh, 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 positive power externalities, of course, spillover effects, the same. But if you tell me about nowadays, I believe we are in a kind, kind of, uh, can I say, in the middle of a bad and a good scenario. Okay, I, I try to say, uh, I, I'm trying to be optimistic in my personal way of living. But I believe that nowadays we are living, uh, how can I say in English, a moment, at uh, this moment, of uh, we can go beyond our to get back in the society's ways of living. Okay? Um, let me allow another um, speakers to speak. Professor Germano, would you like to talk about the, uh, how economics deal? I, I am an economist, sorry. <laughs> so okay. I think about economic opportunities. How do economics deal with the sociology and Lumen's point of view? And in, and they try to, to uh, join with the, the professor at all. Um, oh yeah. And, and other uh, uh, laws here, and including Professor Julio Cesar, how can you, you can, uh, how can I say, link these points of view in, with a good or a bad future? Of course, we are talking about post-pandemic future. Please, you talk. Okay, thank you very much, Daniel, for, for allowing me to, to, to explain a little further about the communications between economic and law system. Well, uh, not using Lumen's uh, line of thought, you may find a very interesting line of research right now in Brazil based on, on the knowledge that comes from the United States. And we, we, call, we call this line of thought of law and economics, okay? Uh, this is uh, right now in Brazil being developed by several authors, okay? Uh, who try to, 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 to put inside the law system information from economic systems, but in my opinion, according, according uh, the economic point of view, which is a, a mistake for me, okay? Uh, the point the point is how you how you can take the informations that you get from economic system okay and translate it into a law communications and how can we do that using the code and the program of each system as i said before hashed is the code unhashed is the program it means that everything that it's not law will be used to define what law is. But again, uh, law, when that's the problem, because I'm German, even in my name, you know, I'm German, so uh, when I talk, when I think about law, I cannot translate what hash is in, in English, because hash for Germans, is much more than just a piece of paper that we call law. Law is tradition, law is living law, law is everything that surrounds law, okay? And law, it's not only one, the law that came from the government or for an institutionalized power. Law is beyond, below, further, and alongside the law. You have, you have in your university, uh, uh, Jose Geraldo de Souza Jr., who defends, who defends that you can find law on the streets, okay? But uh, anyway, I, I, what I try to say, to, to stress here is that you have law and economics being studied 
in faculties of law and, and master and doctorate programs in Brazil right now using uh, not Lumen Systems Theory. Okay, but according to Lumen Systems Theory, it's, it's possible. It's possible to, to get. Uh, I try to, to, to make an example here. Uh, in mm -hmm. economics, you have, like we say, the present of the future. You deal with the present of the future because you need to make decisions right now that will affect the future. The problem is the law. It's the opposite. The law try to control the future because when I say, okay, you cannot kill someone, okay? What I'm basically saying is that you will kill someone because if no one kills someone, I don't need the rule of law to tell you you don't need to kill someone. So uh, the law is basically uh, the cognitive normative of the future. I'll try to construct something in the future. But in order to do that, I take examples for the past. So I, it's like, like the past of the future in the future, in, in a way that you can never start the future. But economics deals with the present of the future in order not to construct the future, but to take risks for the future in another kind of thought. Because as I said before, I'm just a lawyer. I will always think about what is according the law and what is not according the law. When the economics will need to deal with other issues. The one, the one that I have mentioned before is scarcity, but you need to, to deal with credit, to have credit or not have credit. You need to deal with the risks with what we call in German Wette, okay? And you, you have another kind of learning. You have another kind of learning that, than law learn, you know? In order to... Okay. No, no, thanks. I'll take the opportunity um, the, of your words, another kind of learning, and take the opportunity to ask to other, uh, other colleagues here. Thank you very much. Another way of learning. Please, um, as our, our president, <laughs> please, Mr. Gary Jacobs. <laughs> uh, um, Thank you very much to be here. Uh, um, what would you like to tell us, please? Well, thank you, Danielle, and I, my, my thanks and congratulations to the speakers. This was a superb session, and I wish we had much more time to discuss the papers. Uh, I, I do have some questions. I don't know whether there'll be time to be answered, but I'd like to put them forth, because, Danielle, I thought your presentation on the positive externalities and their spillover effects was a very original and constructive way of looking at the pandemic. And Jonilio has done a wonderful job of pointing out the negative uh, uh, effects that we have to deal with as is his responsibility and he's right to do it. I'm tempted to ask him because he's so insightful whether he could identify some of the positive spillover effects. Uh, I know it's difficult to think in both modes at the same time, uh, but I'm thinking of things like uh, things that are now happening in the US, which I think, and, and other places which never would have happened if it hadn't been for the pandemic, like the push for the 15 hour minimum wage, uh, the push uh, for going back to the Paris uh, Accord, uh, the, 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 dissemination of money to, the, to compensate for the uh, tax cuts for the rich and, and to balance it. We've had unprecedented events which break through the, the barriers of this conservative neoliberalism that we haven't been able to touch for two decades. Suddenly there are some openings there. So it's a big topic and I think I'd love to hear Jamilio's uh, comments on it, if not now at the uh, at some other time. Uh, I thought your comment, uh, Danielle, about the solar is, is so interesting because 
the pandemic has really made it much more obvious to us how great is the danger and how great is the need for our global collaboration, uh, which otherwise we would be so complacent about the solar, uh, about the climate change as we have been about uh, the pandemic until it hit us. So there are, I think the list of positive spillover effects is really worth developing. Uh, Neantro mentioned a few of them uh, and it would be very, uh, for the academy, it would be wonderful to really look in terms of education of what the full positive spillover effects of the pandemic of how if we respond to it positively. And I'm, I'm taking too much time. So I just wanted to end with a comment to Germano. I thought your presentation was superb and your effort to link law and society and show us the complexity of the situation. It was a brilliant uh, uh, way of showing the complexity of our disciplines, which are all taught separately. <laughs> and until we start, we've been focusing on transdisciplinarity uh, and the importance of it. And until our technology people come to understand the impacts on society, and until uh, 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 our, our legal and our medical teams have this crossover, we're gonna have these huge gaps. So you've done a wonderful uh, case, case of highlighting the gaps in our educational and our conceptual system. Uh, very creative contributions. Thank you to you all. Gary Jacobs, uh, uh, we have another four uh, colleagues to, that like to talk. Please, Professor Juanillo, talk to us. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to ask a few questions. But of course, you have just a uh, uh, few moments to do this. Well, in this case, I would like very much to ask a question direct to Professor Neanto Savida Rivano. Uh, I think at first, I think that the organization of this event, uh, which tied to its perspective on pandemic, is very important. We need to be careful about the future. I did have some conversation with a couple of colleagues, and they tend to say, well, two of them tend to say that, well, Perhaps it's too early to say about the future, about the perspective on pandemic. One of them also told me something like this. Well, to discuss this somewhat is a kind of fiction. Fiction. I see that Neandro does not have the same opinion. And I would appreciate very much to listen what he thinks about this kind of comment. Please, Professor Neandro. Thank you, Joanillo, for your for your question. I actually I was uh, after listening to your um, talk. I I perceived uh, that you have um, this kind of question in, in your mind, and uh, well, there were two things that. Um, I want to say on this re on this regard. One is about, um, and this has appeared in other um, interventions as well, is whether we um, we can have an optimistic or a pessimistic attitude in relation to what will come afterwards. Um, of course, as we are living the, the pandemic now, um, and uh, it is as being in the middle of a storm. We, we think that sun will never um, appear again. But of course, we have lived, the humankind, not, not we of course, but humankind has gone through many crises in the, in the past millennia. Um, and the fact is that we have always uh, survived. It doesn't mean that we will survive all of them. Um, in the case of the, of the pandemic crisis, I am pretty confident that we will survive this crisis as well. Of course, the environmental crisis, as Gary pointed out a couple of days ago, is much more sweet. So that is um, something to be worried about. Um, 
and it is true, as you said, Jornilio, that um, we are not preparing for it. We are far from being uh, prepared for it. But again, looking at the future, in the case of other crises, uh, humankind has never prepared for, for crisis. Uh, in that, in never done its homework uh, for that. Naturally, this environmental crisis is much more serious. So we are really pushing the limits uh, of, of our planet. Um, so still, um, well, I am an optimistic uh, by nature. Um, so my tendency would be uh, to be rather optimistic than pessimistic. But of course, this is a scientific matter. We need to ascertain whether we eventually will reach a point of no return. Um, so um, that is uh, say that is one thing. The, the author is about uh, science fiction. Um, I perceive also that you uh, are not very um, you do not give much value to science fiction. Um, perhaps uh, you have not uh, read as I did uh, from my young age. I, I did read much science fiction. Uh, there is hardly a science fiction movie I have not watched. Um, and I can, again, looking at the past from Jules Verne and others, even older than him, uh, science fiction is really uh, a good predictor of what, uh, of what happens later because it is written by humans uh, and gifted humans who have that um, capacity of imagining things that eventually will take place. So we should not ignore science fiction. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Neandro. Uh, I know that Professor Julio Cesar would like to talk. Thank you very much, Professor Julio Cesar, to wait. Um, and uh, what can you tell finally yes. to us? Uh, I, I, will, I, will be, um, I, will, I will talk in a short time. I, I would like first to thank everybody for this meeting. Uh, I'd like the World Academy of Art and Science. And I, I say that I, I can say that, that I could talk about ne necropolitics as Tauco Aquil Mbembe of this moment in Brazil. The situation is serious, usually for poor people in communities without vaccination, the omission of federal authorities. So uh, I think that uh, Brazil is a um, uh, reality in, in, in a scenario of pandemic and COVID-19. And it's so important, the World Academy of Art and Science, to talk about our situation and to um, can, in, you can de debate this theme, the situations not, not here. I, I would like to thank everybody and Professor Sandy Pinheiro for your coordinating. Oh, I'd like to thank all of you. I'd like to thank your kind and warm participation. Thank you very much.